Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our panelists and also to online participants. Welcome to today's webinar on the prospect of climate policy and cooperation expectation of COP27. My name is Nong Hong. I am the executive director of the Institute for China American Studies. ICAS is an independent think tank based here in Washington, DC, which focuses on research on many of the key issues affecting and concerning the US-China relations, including climate change, which we'll be discussing today. Today's event is co-organized by ICAS and the Institute for China Europe Studies, a Brussels-based think tank uh, studying operation not long ago, which aims to enhance academic communication between Europe and China on a wide range of topics, including climate change and ocean governance. This webinar is a part of uh, the series event ICAR's uh, Blue Carbon and Climate Change Program, which was launched in March this year. Uh, ICAR's Blue Carbon Climate Change Program exposed the new policy pathway for developing blue carbon in uh, a sustainable way and also combating climate change. And then most uh, prominently, the program uh, endeavors to find new pathways for pathways for multilateral engagement, and also mediation in areas of competition to promote mutual beneficial cooperation on climate change wherever possible. Allow me to say a few words on the background of today's, the theme of today's webinar. So we are all aware that there is less than a month before the 27th session of the Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is set to take place um, in Egypt from November 7 to 18 this year. So when, while we're putting together this program, we identify many climate related topic that deserves a deeper analysis and discussion. So we hope to explore the state practices on questions like uh, whether those countries achieve uh, the goal on their climate uh, protection agenda as they promised at last year's COP27 or uh, 26. Are, these, uh, are there any uh, remarkable domestic policy designed to fulfill this agreement? And also as important topic of COP27, what would be the example of practical measures in assisting developing countries to mitigate and reverse and climate change? Those are issues that we look forward to hear our experts' voice at today's webinar. To start with, I will be uh, delighted to have uh, Professor Wang Shen to join us at today's uh, dialogue. Professor Wang is a senior advisor of ICAS Blue Carbon and Climate Change Program. He is the current president of the National Institute for the South China Sea Studies. For over 20 years, Professor Wang has immersed himself in a variety of research fields, including, for example, international relations, regional security strategy, islands development, and also research on Hainan free trade port. His work on blue carbon has been widely uh, circulated and, and also quoted in many of the media. So without further ado, i give the floor to you, Professor Wang. Thank you, Madam Hong uh, good evening and good morning and good evening to all the panelists and the participants uh, online. I would like to echo the theme of today's webinar by saying that responding to climate changes, achieving sustainable development are urgent tasks facing the international community. Allow me to take this opportunity to contribute to the discussion from the perspective of climate policy and blue carbon economy. For more than a year, the National Institute for the South China Sea Studies has paid close attention to blue carbon, an important issue related to climate change and sustainable development. As a main neutral carbon sink of marine ecosystems, blue carbon has significant advantages over green carbon in carbon capture and storage. A pleasant international blue carbon cooperation has been advancing from the stage of scientific research to the trend that includes blue carbon in international climate governance. China has about 3 million 
square kilometers of waters under its jurisdiction and 18,000 kilometers of continental coastlines. It is one of the few countries in the world that has three major blue carbon ecosystems, mangroves, seagrass beds, and salt marshes. As early as 2015, China put forward some policies on blue carbon. In 2019, the State Council of China approved the implementation plan for the National Ecological Civilization Pilot Zone, Hainan, under which Hainan is encouraged to carry out a pilot project for carbon sinks in the marine ecosystem. In February 2021, the Hainan International Blue Carbon Research Center was inaugurated in Haiko City, which mainly focuses on the basics and theories in the field of blue carbon. The promotion of pilot demonstrations for increasing blue carbon sinks and the integration and in innovation of blue carbon pol public policies. We have done lots of blue carbon related research here in Hainan. However, I have to admit that there are still many difficulties that remain to be solved. For example, many countries and the international institutions do not have enough experience in the development of carbon projects in coastal and marine ecosystems and have not yet established a standardized blue carbon monitoring system. Hence, it is difficult to obtain relatively uniform blue carbon data. In the remaining few minutes, I would like to make a few proposals to promote international cooperation on blue carbon. The first is to raise awareness of addressing climate change and strengthening blue carbon cooperation. We can fully rely on the existing international platforms, such as the sub-foreign dialogue with Hainan under the framework of the Ball Forum for Asia, put together programs of blue carbon cooperation, strengthen academic discussions, and promote exchanges and cooperation between China and other countries and regions. We should promote think tanks cooperation by jointly building a blue carbon pragmatic exchanges and cooperation platform by increasing the blue carbon scientific publicity among others. The second is to strengthen research and cooperation in blue carbon technologies, policies, and rules. We should work together to enhance our discourse power in the global effort to tackle climate changes. China and other, other countries should jointly work on expressing our concerns on global climate governance and ocean governance under the principle of equality. We should establish collaboration mechanisms, de develop joint action plans, and imp implement practical ocean cooperation projects. One very specific suggestion is to accelerate the formulation of ocean carbon think models and the standard systems that can be promoted globally. Third, we should enhance cooperation to preserve and restore blue carbon ecosystems. We could work together on the preservation of ocean biodiversity, the re restoration of coral reefs, mangroves, seagrass beds, coast ashery, coast dew, as well as the monitoring and the research of wetland ecosystems. We should take the initiative 
to protect our resources advantages relate, related to carbon, blue carbon and increase our carbon sinks. The fourth is to explore opportunities for cooperation on international demonstration projects with the goal of increasing blue carbon sinks. Actively explore the spillover effort brought by the development of blue carbon sink enhancement projects and effectively promote the development of new marine industries such as marine ecosystem, marine leisure fishery, blue carbon technical services, and blue carbon finance. Last but not the least, to strengthen personal training, personnel training, and international exchanges. The development of blue carbon is very much depend on sustainable, sustainable participation of professionals. Countries and regions should focus on the overall planning of blue carbon professional education and training. Thanks for giving me this opportunity to share my humble thoughts on the issue of climate change from the perspective of blue carbon. I look forward to hearing more climate policies development from our panelists. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Professor Wang, for a very enlightening uh, remark on climate change and blue carbon economy development. It's very inspiring to hear your thoughts on how to promote international cooperation on blue carbon development from different perspectives. Now, let's turn out to our distinguished panelists today to share their views on the climate policy and practices of each country or region on climate change. We have four distinguished speakers at today's webinar. You will read their full bio at ICAS website. Let me quickly introduce them before I give the floor to them. So uh, Ms. Ankara uh, Hirod, she's the direct executive director of uh, Institute for Applied Ecology Research, with the uh, office in Berlin and also in a few other cities in Europe. Her research fo uh, focus uh, in cruel international Europe and national climate policy, among her several uh, climate-related functions, she is a European Union negotiator in the negotiation under the UNFCCC. And our second speaker, Ms. Sally Yotzer, she is the senior fellow and director of the Environment Security Program at Stimson Center based here in Washington, DC. Her research examines the suit environmental thrust that have potential to undermine national, regional, and global uh, security. Um, her work focuses on ocean uh, security, climate security, and wildlife um, protection. And then we have Dr. Tan Fei. He is the Associate Professor and Deputy Director of the Institute of Energy, Environment, and Economy at Tsinghua University from China. His research interests include climate policy, international climate regimes, consumer behavior in energy consumption, and also energy monitoring. And our last speaker, Dr. Keda Brukara. He is an affiliate research fellow at Ocean Policy Research Institute at Sasakawa Foundation of Japan. He has more than 30 years experience with marine and coastal environmental research, has been also very actively in, uh, involved in local, national, regional, and global action for marine environmental conservation and restoration with the integrated coastal management interpretation. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, give the floor to uh, Ms. Enko Haraf. Thank you very much, Hong. I will, um, and um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening um, to everybody, wherever you are in at the moment. I have some slides, so I will share my screen. And then I will. Can you see my screen now? Uh, not, not yet. Can you try it again? Okay. I think there is a green uh, button. Ah, no, right I, 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 I think, yeah, sorry. 
Yeah, I think now it is working. Is it okay? Yes. I'm um, sorry, sorry. Um, this is the first one. So, um, yeah, my, my presentation will not go into the topic of blue carbon, as we have heard um, before, because I think one of the big um, issues is that my own country um, is also at the beginning of studying um, that issue of blue carbon and of monitoring blue carbon. So I will be looking in a much broader scope and much more also into the energy sector um, for today's topic. So the, the first um, issue I was looking at, what is the status of the national determined contributions after COP26? So what happened um, in the past year? So um, prior to the last COP in Glasgow, we have seen I think 125 updates of NDCs and new NDCs. Um, this year we have only a few NDC updates um, because it's a very simple reason, 2022 is not a year in which updates are required under the UNFCCC. So this cycle is every five years, so and it was more last year, but nevertheless some additional NDC updates and some new NDCs were submitted. Um, from for some large countries, um, for, each, for example, Argentina, Australia, Brazil, and India submitted um, NDCs with increased mitigation ambition. We, you can see um, here in this table, there are some other um, NDCs um, updates which clarified some other aspects of the NDCs but did not change the mitigation ambition. And below the table, you can see that a, number, a couple of other countries have also been um, active in this um, area. Then we have the other part that under the UNFCCC, we also should, countries also should submit long-term strategies. And um, um, when, you, when, we, when we assess those strategies by the end of um, September this year, um, so far 140 countries now announced that they have net zero targets. And those country, these countries cover close to 90% of the global emissions. Um, when we were looking at the same issue last year, we only had 130 countries covering 70% of global emissions. So we got 10 additional countries and now almost a coverage of 90% of global emissions by countries that have net zero emission targets. I think that is um, quite a positive development. And I guess we will not get that many additional number of countries now in the future years because we already have um, so many. Um, then I was also looking a bit, what does global energy data for the first half of 22 is telling us? So what we can see in this graph here, the global electricity demand um, rose by 3%. This is this blue bar. And what you can see on the left, wind and solar met 77% of this demand. Um, this is like compared to the previous years. The fossil generation at global level um, was al almost unchanged. Coal generation rose in the EU and India, but decreased in China and the US. But this is only like the first half of um, 22. Um, it was hard to find data um, for the later parts, but I guess it will change a bit um, in um, the when you also include the summer months. But that shows that we are coming closer to the tipping point where renewable generation growth will meet the future electricity demand growth. And in my view, 22 proves one key fact, which is important for global mitigation. Wind and solar power, they provide effective solutions to climate mitigation, to energy security, and to low costs. We have a very specific situation this year in the EU. Not sure whether you are all aware of this because the EU, in my view, is facing a triple energy crisis in 22. On the one hand, we have a nuclear crisis in France. 32 out of 56 nuclear reactors are shut down in France. 16 of the newest reactors due to corrosion pro um, problems. That is about 22 gigawatt of nuclear capacity, which is really huge. The remaining reactors are shut down due to plant maintenance. You can see this in this um, 
um, in this graph below, like the violet part is the nuclear generation this year in France. So usually it is about like 40,000 gigawatt hours um, that has been in January, then these reactors have been shut down. And now we are at about like half of the nuclear generation in France and France has a lot of nuclear um, power plants. And um, it is unclear, like at least until the end of this year, they will not come into operation yet. So this is a huge gap. You can also see here on the left-hand side in the um, EU um, um, electricity generation. Then we are facing the climate crisis. So the drought um, in Europe in summer affected hydro energy in 22. This you can see here also in this graph, um, graph that compared to 21, hydro um, in the first half of um, this year um, had much lower um, contribution to the electricity generation in Europe. Um, and then we have the war in Ukraine and the sanction that are affecting the gas supply and now also the um, sabotage effects um, of the um, pipelines, which are which means that also like the physical um, delivery of gas is no longer possible. That in particular affects my own country, Germany, where 55% of the natural gas imports in 21 were from the Russian Federation. And 82% of Germany's domestic gas consumption is for heat. Um, only a small share is for electricity. So that means Germany is now activating fossil fired reserve power plants into operation due to this situation. Some hard coal power plants, some lignite power plants, and a few oil power plants. Um, this will certainly also for 22 increase Germany's um, emissions. So I will then explain a little bit on the status of the EU mitigation policies. Um, the EU's target um, um, for 2030 is a emission reduction of 55% compared to 1990. And there is a package of um, legislation called Fit for 55. <coughs> Sorry. with a lot of separate um, parts of pieces of legislation um, that is implementing um, this um, target. Um, today's meeting is too short. I will not be able to go in all these um, elements. I will go in the first three. <coughs> the first is like the emission trading system. The changes that are proposed here is that the um, target becomes more um, ambitious. Um, and increases from 43% for 2030 um, emission reduction to 61%. We will have a faster reduction of the cap in the ETS. Um, at the moment, the um, cap is reduced each year by 2.2%. In the future, it will be reduced each year by 4.2%. Um, then the ETS will be extended to maritime transport, and there will be a separate new emission trading system for buildings and road transport and a gradual phasing out of free allowances for certain sectors. Then we have the part of the EU's emissions that, is, that are not under the ETS, but um, those are covered by the effort sharing regulation. Also there, the um, mitigation ambition is increased. So the target um, um, was 29% um, reduction in 2030 um, compared to 2005. It will now increase to 40% um, um, reduction. And this, um, the effort sharing regulation has individual targets for each member state. And here on the right side of this um, graph, uh, here <clears throat> you can see in the green part how the um, targets of the individual member states have been strengthened. <laughs> then we have the third part of the legislation, the um, land use, land use change and forestry regulation. So far, the target was that the emissions in the land use sector should balance out, should be balanced out by net removals. In the future, we have a clear target of a net removal for 2030 um, by minus 310 megatons of CO2 equivalents. 
And in this legislation, we also will have binding net removal targets for each individual EU member state. And then also the reporting and accounting rules have been simplified and are closer to the Paris Agreement rules. All these pieces of legislations are now in the trilogue phase. This is the last phase of negotiation of a compromise between the Council, the European Parliament and the Commission. Um, we can also see, already see now that the key elements and the ambition will be kept and have already been agreed. And it's um, only about certain details that are now missing. And there are a few more meetings, but um, <clears throat> so until the end of this year, this package um, will be agreed and adopted in the EU. So then I have been looking in my last part at climate actions through multilateral initiatives. At the COP in Glasgow, we have seen an unprecedented um, um, number of cooperative climate initiatives. More than 150 of such initi initi initiatives were launched at um, COP26. Of course, an overview of all these initiatives is difficult. So I, what I did for this presentation, I selected two examples. One was the one is the Global Methane Pledge. This was launched by the US and the EU and 112 countries joined this pledge. The goal is to reduce global methane emissions by at least 30% by 2030 compared to 2020 levels. And seven of the world's top methane emitters signed this pledge. And those are responsible for 53% of global methane emissions. So, but this pledge has some shortcomings in my view. Like on the one hand, China, India, Russia, and Iran are not part of the pledge. And those countries are responsible for 30% of the global methane emissions. Also, there are no individual country pledges and the review of progress on an annual basis is undertaken by dedicated ministerial meetings. So there are no monitoring reports based on data um, related to um, from countries or uh, activities of individual countries. And we had similar initiatives already on methane um, in 2004 and in 2009, which at that time also included the Russian Federation. And in my view, um, in the inventories, we did not see significant emission decreases um, of methane um, after those previous pledges. And it may have been useful to assess those first before starting the next one. Then another big um, pledge was the Glasgow Leaders Declaration on Forests and Land Use. 143 countries signed this declaration. The goal is to stop and reverse forest loss and land degradation by 2030. Um, also, this um, initiative has some shortcomings. There are no individual pledges. The monitoring and tracking is unclear. And in my view, it is worse than the earlier global forest initiatives we have seen. As, as you have presented, I have been in the UNFCCC negotiations for more than 20 years. So I have seen many of um, these forest declarations in the past. And one very important one was in 2014, the New York Declaration on Forest. Um, it also had the um, target of ending deforestation and that was at that time by 2020. So we did not end um, deforestation by 2020. So now the goal is changed to 2030. Um, but that, uh, but is, is this now um, more achievable is a bit the question mark. Um, and the New York Forest Declaration at least installed a monitoring program of the pledge through independent organizations, which we don't have now for this Glasgow um, Declaration in my view. So in my view, the forest pledge is insufficient because it is not followed by appropriate monitoring and tracking. So how can those global initiatives become more than empty promises at COPs? In my view, they need a clear design also of individual commitments of countries and other stakeholders joining the initiative in addition to a global target. They should have clear schedules for commitments. They should have annual transparent monitoring of progress, both emissions and actions implemented by independent organizations. They should include initiatives. The initiatives should also be included in the NDC updates of the 
parties um, joining these initiatives, and there should also be a periodic evaluation and review. So now for COP27, I have seen that the COP presidency has already announced the launch of 17 new initiatives. And I hope that my five points here will help you in um, considering those initiatives um, in when they are coming up. And so with this, I thank you very much for your um, attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Anchor. And that's, I thank you for sharing your expertise on uh, climate policy and practices from an energy sector perspective. I'm quite impressed with uh, the multilateral initiative and that you just mentioned, and then also very impressed by uh, your recommendation, how to achieve those goals raised by those multilateral initiatives. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, raise question Q&A when we uh, finish the first round of our opening remark. So now, thank you again. I'm giving the floor to uh, Sally. Great. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening, everybody. Um, and thank you to Hong Hong and Professor Wong from uh, the Institute for China and American Studies and to all for organizing this event. It's terrific. And a special thanks actually to Dr. Wong for highlighting blue carbon and Dr. Harold. What a great overview of the EU's climate work um, and the international multilateral updates uh, uh, heading into COP27. So um, as, as Nong mentioned, I'm the director of the Environmental Security Program at the Stimson Center. We're a, a nonpartisan research organization in Washington, DC. Um, and our work really does focus on um, uh, climate security, uh, natural resource security, and we work with governments and communities all around the world because when you think of these natural resource issues, it really does undermine economic, food, and ecological security um, of many uh, countries. And, and there's just no threat greater than obviously what we're facing um, uh, uh, with the climate emergency. I mean, we only have to look recently at the hurricane that hit Florida here in the United States, Hurricane Ian, or the recent floods in Pakistan, or we can even look back at the record heat and drought across Europe and in China. So this is really a serious issue. I mean, thinking about last year um, in 2021, I think the top 10 climate disasters caused an estimated $170 billion worth of damage which just underlines the growing threat crime, climate change can propose to global stability. Um, and with COP just 27, I mean, COP 27 just occurring next month, there really is a big opportunity as, as there are in every COP. And again, Dr. Harold just out, laid out um, so many opportunities um, that we really need to take ser serious about getting those climate pledges into doable action, not just promises, but action, uh, if we're going to keep the warming below the 1.5 degrees or that, that are the goals. And, and also we have to remember, we need to really help um, communities around the world adapt to the climate change that they're already facing. Um, and I was glad to see the increases in the NDCs uh, as laid out in the targets of countries doing better at meeting their NDCs and, uh, and meeting their goals, but we still have to keep the world on track and there's a lot, a lot of work to do. So despite all of these challenges, Nong had asked me to talk about what the Biden administration has been doing um, in the, here in the United States. Um, and really since day one of the Biden administration addressing climate change, and the climate emergency has really been a priority all across the administration. They've put forth really robust uh, plans to address the crisis and work to secure funding to match these ambitions. Um, for example, uh, just recently uh, this summer, a new law was passed. It's called the Inflation Reduction Act, or it's easier to say the IRA, um, and it includes billions of dollars in investments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by uh, over 40% by 2030. And that om almost meets the uh, administration's target, ambitious target of 50 to 52% reduction um, against its uh, 2005 uh, outputs. 
Um, and what does it include? Well, it includes a lot of measures to really supercharge, as we say, our renewable energy development here in the United States. Um, and that includes putting funding into accelerating the adoption of electric vehicles, building out our, our uh, charging stations all across our interstates, um, really ramping up our smart grid technologies, um, jumpstarting carbon capture. Um, and altogether, estimates say that the IRA may unlock more than $800 billion in total climate spending. But when you add on all the association, association uh, spending and, 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 and private sector, some have suggested that the economy could, that this new economy basing off of the IRA could reach 1.7 trillion. Um, that was a recent report by Credit Suisse, 1.7 trillion dollars uh, of new jobs and, and uh, financing programs. Um, and the US also has a component in, in this of really trying to do an international climate finance plan. And that um, plan is the, the goal of the US government is to double, double our annual public climate financing um, for developing countries uh, by 2024. And the president's emergency plan for adaptation and resilience, that's the president's emergency plan for adaptation and resilience, or prepare, which is again much easier to say. That's going to provide uh, at least three billion dollars in annual adaptation finance um, annually by 2024, and they've already started putting out projects on that. So this is really a whole of U.S. government approach to mainstream the needs to reduce emissions. It's the transportation sector, the energy sector. Um, there's a lot of work going on at NOAA in its marine sector uh, and coastal sector. Um, and, and, and our Treasury Department is working um, on financing and our State Department obviously is very involved with all the negotiations. So it really is every part of the US government is working on these issues. Um, and the US government is also working uh, with its international partners as um, uh, Dr. Harold knows so well. Um, just a few weeks ago, the US, Japan, and South Korea uh, plan to work together to increase, increase uh, improved access to climate mitigation and adaptation financing. Um, at the UN General Assembly, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the Biden administration hosted the Global Clean Energy Action Forum and the Global Food Security Summit to coordinate international action on climate mitigation and adaptation. And at COP27 next month, um, the Biden administration plans to continue both uh, prioritizing the climate uh, energy action um, as well as food security and tackling the methane emissions that were, we were just talked about in the international uh, compact and really increasing that electric vehicle at adoption and decarbonizing shipping. There's a big push for green shipping. Um, and as I said earlier, really a, a, a new focused effort on pr promoting increased support for resilience. Um, and, um, you know, with the Infrastructure Reduction Act or IRA now law, as I said, the US is really on track to meet its goals. Um, you know, there are a lot of big goals out there. I mean, the US and China have huge goals in front of them. Um, I think China plans to peak its carbon in 2030 and then ratchet that down in carbon neutrality uh, by 2060. You know, a bold, a bold goal to say the least. Um, you know, and as we go into COP27, let's, you know, not forget that there are a lot of tensions that exist, um, you know, uh, and tensions between China and the United States. Um, in August, China really, <clears throat> excuse me, suspended some of its, suspended the talks on climate change with the United States, the bilateral talks. Um, and, you know, this is unfortunate. It included a joint working group, as we know, that it helped really lead the signing of the Paris Agreement as far back as 2015. 
and had been revived when uh, the Biden administration came in. Um, and um, we really need to hope to get this back on track. Other tensions, um, as noted earlier, there is the war in Ukraine that has created a huge uh, global uncertainty um, in the energy supply. And when you think about you know, both of our countries, as well as your, uh, you know, facing rising coal and oil prices, OPEC just announced deep output cuts in oil last week, and coal prices have continued to go up over the past few months, um, higher than they've been in decades. And so this further increases um, what I would say is strong incentives for Europe, China, the United States to really accelerate the shift um, that frankly, the EU has been doing a terrific job on for renewable energy and electric vehicles and smart grids and carbon capture. Um, you know, there is power in the marketplace. And if China, the US and Europe work together, they can really help drive the global market and drive down the cost of wind and solar, develop these new breakthrough technologies, reduce greenhouse gases and emissions at home and really propel a global clean energy re revolution, um, not just in our countries, but across Africa and Asia. Um, so I'm really hoping that looking past um, post COP27, that you know it'll be after the party Congress uh, and the elections and after the US American um, midterm elections, those of them, you know, these events will be over because I, I believe they've been kind of ratcheting up some of the political rhetoric uh, on both sides of the Pacific. And my hope is that once the elections are over, it'll help lower the temperature a bit and the relationship uh, in particular between China and the US will improve. Um, you know, I think my old boss uh, said it well when John Kerry said in August, the climate crisis is not about geopolitics or ideology. It's about both of these countries coming to work together to address the climate threat uh, facing all of us. Um, if we could just pop up, uh, I have two slides I just wanna quickly pop up if it's possible. Um, and this issue of really working together was loudly raised in Glasgow during COP26. You know, when the African nations, the small island developing states pushed heavily for more adaptation and investment funding from wealthy countries, um, leading to the Glasgow Climate Pact, promoting double climate finance for adaptation by 2025 to at least $40 billion. And, and record international pledges um, you know, came in to support the adaptation fund. Uh, but this is just a fraction of the 300 billion that the UN estimates will be needed by the year 2030. And you can see why when you look at this slide, because climate is really multi-dimensional and requires really multi-dimensional approaches. Um, and when I think about this slide, um, you know, the US and China have such an opportunity to cooperate and um, really try to work together to strengthen climate resilience abroad. I mean, both countries have experienced their own devastating extreme weather, as I just mentioned earlier, um, but they also could really help um, collectively with many of uh, countries across the global south um, to elevate a collective ambition. Um, you know, we, we hear about the Belt and Road Initiative and we hear about the US Build Back Better World Plan. Well, why not try to make it a, a green plan that really helps build adaptation and resilience together in many of these countries. I mean, we could leverage the advantages to promote both on the infrastructure, the renewable and smart energy technologies and pro projects, but also combine green, green infrastructure to respond to much of the vulnerabilities we see on this slide and increase the nature-based solutions, advancing the blue carbon capture as noted by Dr. Wong earlier. So building climate resilience also requires recognizing that these cities and coastal communities, uh, particularly, as I said, in the developing uh, countries and SIDS, are at the forefront of climate emergency today. 
Um, they're grappling not only with the environmental issues that climate change proposes, but the underlying economic and social issues that really can exacerbate the climate emergency. Things like inequality, youth unemployment, and governance gaps. So these multidimensional factors are also aggravated, as you can see on the slide, by physical constraints in developing countries from things like aging infrastructure or non-existent in infrastructure, such as water and wastewater, crumbling seawalls, and informal and illegal housing that just make the climate crisis even more when an event hits. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, you know, at the Stimson Center, we actually have been working on this issue and we've been working with uh, Dr. Furukawa's organization, the, um, the Sasakawa Ocean Policy Research Institute, um, to, to really try to address this, address this multi-pronged problem. Um, uh, we've, con we've created what's called Corby and it's a vulnerability assessment. And you can see all of the issues it looks at. Um, it uh, looks holistically from the land to the sea scape, focusing on economic, political, and social and environmental risk factors. And we work with SIDS and coastal nations to really pinpoint what are their highest coastal risks. So they, and we produce an integrated risk assessment with specific recommendations uh, for them to take action. And this will build into what's coming out of the promises at COP and the UN, the adaptation plans, the finance to really help raise those ambitions so that um, countries around the global south and uh, uh, SIDS can really get the funds they need and, and use those, those resources widely. We've been doing CORVI now in 11 uh, cities and coastal communities around the globe, and we expect to announce at least five more uh, during COP27. So, this is the kind of holistic approach that uh, is needed for climate finance from the US, from China, Europe, Japan, and others um, to address some of these critical climate risks. Um, and just in closing, let me say, environmental diplomacy is the key and cooperation on climate resilience and carbon reduction and mitigation are really essential if we're gonna meet the targets and really help the global South grow in a smart uh, ecological way. So I'm gonna end it there and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions uh, shortly. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Sally, for sharing the US perspective on many of the legislation or law and policy uh, lately. I know there are a lot of action from the administration lately on climate issues. I look forward to asking a few questions about on the US perspective later during the Q&A. I totally agree with you that um, climate issue is not a geopolitical one. It should be an, an area that actually mobilizes international or regional cooperation. So with that, I'm going to turn it to Dr. Tan Fei to share his experience from a Chinese perspective on this issue. Uh, thank you very much. And also, uh, good evening, uh, good afternoon, and good morning to our audience. And thank you very much for having me uh, to be here uh, to uh, share some of my views. Today, I would like to um, touch upon three topics. Firstly, uh, the progress of China's climate action. And secondly, China's expectation for uh, COP27. And also thirdly, I'd like to give uh, very short comments on the uh, recent proposal on the CBAM and also the Climate Club recently proposed by G7. Uh, so firstly, I'd like to uh, talk about uh, the uh, progress of uh, China's climate action science, uh, the last year's climate conference. Um, I think last year's um, Glasgow conference uh, was a milestone, and especially after the finish of negotiation on the so-called Paris rulebook, a uh, set of rules uh, to implement Paris Agreement. Uh, and also the COP26 marks a full transition uh, to the implementation phase of the Paris Agreement. Um, and the main task for parties of countries I think right now is to uh, implement their commitment uh, to translate those targets into concrete action, not only for mitigation action, but also for financial commitments. 
Uh, and since last COP, I think that China has made um, tremendous achievements uh, to implement um, its climate action. For example, as you may know that China issued a policy framework for achieving the carbon picking and carbon neutrality last year. And for this year, China has issued more than 20 sectoral and industrial plans and policy documents. Um, all of those together as a policy package that for uh, carbon picking and carbon neutrality goals of China. And those policies covers all sectors, um, uh, all emission sectors, such as energy, industry, agriculture, and also including various supporting policy package, such as uh, MRV, measurement reporting verification of emissions, uh, science and technology research and the development, finance, as well as education. Um, I think those policies together forms a comprehensive policy framework that to ensure that China is on track to achieve the goal of carbon picking and carbon neutrality, and as well as that all 31 provinces also issued their local plan for carbon picking and carbon neutrality. Um, and in fact, in those plans that they contain uh, actions that are ambitions, and some of actions even go beyond the goal of picking carbon uh, before 2030. For example, that uh, in this June, China just released its 45 year plan for renewable energy development. And um, to meet the target in that plan, China will need to add at, at least 100 gigawatts of wind and solar uh, per year over the next five years, which means China will achieve the uh, 1,200 gigawatts goal um, which set out in China in its NDC. And this goal will be met at, at least three years ahead of schedule if China uh, uh, fulfills its target in the uh, 14th five year plan. And also, due to this rapid development of non fossil uh, energy resources in China, China's coal power consumption, uh, China's coal power generation, in fact, uh, fell by uh, 4%. Anka also mentioned this in her slides that in the first half of year 2020, and that also drives China's carbon emission down that for uh, the past four quarters. So um, although it is still earlier or difficult to say whether China's carbon emission have peaked, but there is consensus among Chinese experts that China's carbon emission have reached a plateau. Uh, in addition, that China is increasingly uh, using more market-based uh, uh, policy or instrument to achieve emission reduction rather than traditional command and control policies. China has built the world's largest carbon market, which uh, currently covers more than 2,000 power companies and also 4.5 billion tons of carbon dioxide emission. And in order to ensure the effective operation of the carbon market um, and uh, 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 legislation process right now is underway, which is um, the consideration of the regulation on carbon emission trading. And this is a regulation, uh, a very important regulation that will improve the legal basis of China's carbon market and continue to promote uh, uh, the expansion of the carbon market. And also that uh, uh, in addition to, to that, there is also a lot of progress on uh, green finance that the Central Bank of China right now has set up an uh, innovative monetary policy tools that to provide uh, low cost funding for emission reduction actions in China. Uh, in the first half of this year, the Central Bank already provided more than 180 billion of RMB that to projects uh, through the banking system that to promote emission reduction. Uh, and another very important aspect is adaptation. Uh, I think that uh, the previous speakers also mentioned the importance of this adaptation, that this summer, uh, just like many other countries around the world, China also suffered 
the extreme weather events, such as heat waves and drought. And the climate change is all, uh, the um, adaptation is also a part of China's action that to cope with climate change. Uh, in June this year, China just launched a adaptation strategy for 2035, which identifies China's uh, key tasks, key regions, and key sectors for adaptation uh, in the next 15 years till year uh, 2035. And also that uh, China is working on its uh, machine reduction action plan. Um, uh, um, uh, 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 I think that uh, um, that plan is in the process of drafting and will be released before the end of this year. Uh, and secondly, I would like to uh, briefly uh, talk about uh, my expectation from China's perspective for the forthcoming uh, COP27 at the end of this year, in fact, it's last, uh, uh, the next month. Uh, in fact, I think that uh, um, uh, one key issue is for this year that much of the world has suffered uh, from the extreme uh, climate events, and especially for vulnerable developing countries that they in particular they have suffered huge climate losses. And uh, it has been noted that this year's uh, climate conference will be held in Africa, and Egypt will be the host for the conference. And as we all know that Africa is one of the most vulnerable continent, so the issue of adaptation and loss and damage will be a priority for negotiation at this year's conference. Um, especially for loss and damage, which has always been uh, uh, very difficult issues in the negotiation. Um, because of generally this uh, loss of damage is due to the cumulative emission of greenhouse gases in the uh, atmosphere. And most of those cumulative emission came from developed countries. So uh, developing countries ask developed countries that to uh, provide uh, compensation for the loss of, and damage. But rich countries have long uh, history that to opposite this idea of compensation uh, for loss and damage. And G77, in fact, uh, was pushing for a financial facility that to help developing countries uh, who are affected by the climate disaster. Um, and they proposed this proposal in COP26. But however, there was no consensus on this proposal. Um, and uh, one good news is during the UN General Assembly in September of this year, uh, Denmark pledged to provide uh, around uh, $13 million in support of climate damage in developing countries. Um, this is the first time that a rich country has made a commitment to compensate developing countries for the climate damage. Um, so I believe that uh, COP27 should make further progress in adaptation issues and also the lost and damage issues. And another very important area is climate finance. I think that uh, although um, as early as in the 2009 in Copenhagen, that developed countries together uh, committed to provide $100 billion per year that in climate finance for developing countries. But this number has not yet been achieved. It has been, in fact, uh, averaged uh, only uh, 66 billion US dollars per year over the last eight years. And there has been no progress so far uh, in the negotiations on the post-2020 climate finance target. And progress on the climate finance is significantly lagging behind progress on mitigation action. And this is not good because of this will greatly damage the multilateral trust between developing and developed countries. So from my personal point of view that in order to move forward on global climate action, we must not only uh, continue to implement a national mitigation target, but also should make urgent progress uh, on the issues of climate finance and also the loss and damage. Um, which in fact are the most uh, uh, concerns for developing countries. Uh, finally, I would like to make uh, brief comments on the uh, CBAM, the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, and also the 
G7's recent proposal for uh, Climate Club. Um, the idea of the Climate Club was announced in June of this year, and uh, uh, the G G7 side that the, the Climate Club will be launched by the end of this year, which generally uh, together with CBAM to bundle the climate action with the trade. Um, although the exact form of the CBAM and the Climate Club is still not yet 100% clear, um, but I think that uh, to bundle or to link the climate action with trade is, is ineffective and sometimes a dangerous idea. Uh, because of, um, I think that right now, as the previous speaker said, almost all countries in the world that have now made zero emission commitment or carbon neutrality commitment. And especially uh, a lot of developing countries made such kind of commitment. Um, and developing countries are not free rider in climate action. They are very active and positive in terms of the action and the willingness, but they lack the finance and technology transfer that to help them to deal with the low carbon development transition. And using trade policy as a stick to force developing countries uh, to take action uh, will not provide uh, the necessary finance and technology which de developing require that to cope with that transition. And in fact, uh, it uh, will not uh, increase the global ambitions, but will shift the burden of the emission reduction towards developing countries. And sometimes it will do harm to the multilateral trust and the cooperation, which is already very fragile at this moment. So to summarize, I think that uh, uh, achieving the goal of the Paris Agreement will require uh, broader and closer global cooperation and so countries need to uh, effectively to implement the target that they already committed and through a uh, concrete domestic action and developed countries should uh, respond to the developing countries demand for climate finance and make progress on loss and damage at COP27. And the world should work together around uh, a sustainable development transition instead of fighting each other. So uh, by seeing that, I would like to stop here. Thank you very much. Well, thank, you. thank you very much, Dr. Chen Fei, for sharing your views and also uh, your observation on the progress of climate action from China and also regulation policy. Thank you for the briefing. And I, I also particularly very impressed by you, you are giving a very good example of Dennis providing a financial facility for uh, climate damage in developing countries. I think this is one of the issues that we raise in the program, and that's also the expectation for the COP27. But thank you again. Now I'm giving the floor to our last speaker, Dr. Fukukawa. Who is yours? Thank you, Dr. No Hong, and thank you, President Wang Shen, for kind invitation for this important uh, webinar. And uh, I will share my screen to speak. So, oh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all. And uh, this is Keita Furukawa, and uh, I'm working for oh, oh, Japanese uh, NPO group, the Association for Shore Environment Creation, for doing the local action. And also the, for the national and the global level, I'm working for o Ocean Policy Research Institute of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. And also I'm working for the uh, uh, technical session chair uh, in a partnership of environment management for the seas of East Asia. So this is a regional uh, action. So this time I like to introduce uh, a message from Japan uh, and I'd like to report some governmental moves and expect exercises of the voluntary blue carbon crediting uh, doing in Japan. So Japanese governmental moves were a bit slow and moderate after the Paris Agreement in 2015 and the situation moves by the Prime Minister Suga's uh, policy speech on October 2020. And uh, we put a very ambitious target. Uh, so Japan has started to achieve the ambition of the becoming carbon 
neutral by 2050. The intention in interim target were also raised and it covers all the greenhouse gases so that we are expanding our uh, policy target and actions uh, toward to the uh, realization of the uh, carbon neutral uh, society in Japan. For example, the energy policy led by the agency of neutral natural resources and energy. Uh, in the non-electric power part, private industry and transport sectors uh, will minimize the use of the fossil fuels and maximize recycled CO2 and shifting to use of the alternative uh, energy such as hydrogen, methane and biomass uh, already referred by the previous speakers. In the electric power part, decarbonization will implement and supply to the non-e-power uh, sectors. And simultaneously, the fixation of the carbon will be enhanced to compensate the non-deducible -deduce or greenhouse gas emissions. For the, uh, another uh, institution, the Ministry of Land Infrastructure, Transport and Tourism, as a ministry who have responsible on the non-e-power sector in the transport system, uh, specifically the de development of the environment for receiving hydrogen is one of the uh, big target and the development of the environment and implementing the uh, decarbonization under the policy of the carbon neutral port. In the illustration of the carbon neutral port, Four major issue is listed, uh, as you see, that the utilization of the hydrogen, ammonium, etc., via port, uh, and also the secondary target or action is the promotion of the offshore onshore power supply for the ships, to reducing the idling uh, gas emission by the ship, and thirdly, formation of the LNG banking base. In, and uh, finally, the study of the utilization of the hydrogen uh, is also promoted under the uh, ministry. But we have to thinking about this uh, in the joint workshop by the IPBES and the IPCC in 2020. It has been pointed out that the, some good climate change mitigation measures are not compatible with the uh, biodiversity conservation like uh, uh, some uh, another alternative energy having a red line for the uh, measures for the biodiversity actions. In Japan, blue carbon ecosystem conservation and restoration is now coming one of the frontline issues of the climate action, like uh, uh, we can see in, in highlight here. Okay. So uh, Port Bureau of the Ministry of Land Infrastructure, Transport and Tourism is now focusing on the co-benefit of the restoration measures through the construction works. And uh, while the fishery agency put focus on the conservation and aquaculture of the sea glass, seaweed and carpet, specifying 21 different types of the vegetation habitat in uh, uh, in Japan and uh, they divided the Japan as the 10 areas and try to make a formulation of how we can uh, calculate the carbon sequestration the remaining ratio is uh, one of the uh, key factor that uh, that include that uh, transport to the deep ocean uh, by drifting and uh, stocked in the sediment uh, as a sedimentation. And uh, the scientists found that the sequestrated as a refractory carbon fraction, that is a, a remaining part of the carbon, even if uh, it seems like uh, uh, digested, but uh, the refractory carbon fraction can be remain in, as a uh, fixed carbon for 100 years or thousand years even. 
in this sense, uh, as uh, uh, Professor Wang Sheng uh, already he touched upon, that the, uh, the blue carbon sequestration can be happen with the growth of the biomass in the ocean. This is a big, big difference from the green carbon, which is uh, sand for the uh, based on the uh, standing stock of the uh, carbon as a uh, tree body in, a, on, on, on the mountain. So one of the typical blue carbon ecosystem restoration work is the action for eel glass bed restoration. It has been started as a conservation of biodiversity and maximization of the productivity of the uh, sea area, coastal area, if you like. Now it is considered to have a blue carbon sequ sequestration potential. So oh, the, such a sequestrated uh, carbon can be used for the carbon offset for the non, non reducible or CO2 emission by the private company. The private company make use of the uh, our product of the uh, carbon uh, action in the local. But uh, for that purpose, we need a good system for or ha harnessing this uh, trade. The Japan Blue Economy Association uh, is an independent organization uh, uh, followed by the uh, supported by the um, MLIT and the other uh, agency in government. The JBE, Japan Blue Economy Association, has been formed to put certification of the J Blue credit. This is a, a kind of the voluntary credit and establish a new voluntary market of the credit. Through this market, companies can offset their uh, carbon emission and unique point of the JBL credit is uh, that it include the, of course, include the amount of the carbon sequestration, but not only for that, and the cooperative work for the legislation and reduction effort of carbon emission is also counted in the credit. Throughout this model, the company side get the CRS and the uh, CSR and, and the uh, branding for their uh, company and NPO side the get sustainability of uh, getting a financing uh, from the company. In 2021, uh, four sites get authentication of the JBlue credit. Each site has a different methodology and a different uh, way of the measures, the uh, uh, carbon se sequestration uh, rate. But the uh, uh, late itself has been given by the JBE, that the JBE given the uh, scientific uh, background to do the, uh, this authentication. In total, 80.4 tons of the CO2. This is a very, very small uh, if compared with the uh, green carbon in the, on the land, uh, but that has been authenticated in the 2021 and it helps uh, this kind of uh, small, small action to be continuous for all long. It is important to accurately estimate the amount of the seagrass biomass in order to have the credit certification. We are doing as much as possible as a citizen survey or some cooperation with the fishery people, but good cooperation with the academic sectors is uh, inevitable. So oh, these are the recommendations from our Japan's experience for the discussion. We need a good leader for making a decision and the top-down pressure to the change the situation and uh, compatibility of the climate action and the biodiversity action is very, very important, we think. And local link, uh, local action linked with the market initiate bottom-up movement. So we should have view of the inclusive society with good governance and uh, achieving healthy ocean, healthy people, and healthy economy, as stated by the uh, many previous speakers. And uh, the 
write down uh, figure is uh, uh, our framework. Uh, now we are discussing in the PMC for coming uh, sustainable development strategy for the sea of seas of East Asia implementation framework to the 2023 to 2027. So this is under consideration, but uh, uh, we having the uh, effective governance, healthy ocean, healthy people, and healthy economics as uh, our uh, theme. So uh, with this, thank you for your attention. And uh, I'll spoke, stop here and uh, waiting for the uh, good discussion with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Furukara. Very impressive and happy that you share with us the Chinese experience from local government, national government in terms of implementation, particularly voluntary carbon credit authorization. I think that is one of the very good examples maybe a lot of country can actually follow. So without further ado, I'm going to open uh, the floor for q and I, I realized a lot of a couple of questions in the, in the q and box. Uh, let me just go to... Uh, anchor first, because I understand you have a lot of experience working on the international level, regional level, and also national level in terms of climate uh, policy and regulation. So the, the question is like, on your, in your experience, like between Europe as a whole and also individual countries in Europe, are there any uh, conflict of interest or like priority, different priority for EU as a whole and then individual European countries? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for this, Afnan, for this, um, for this question, because I was exactly thinking about um, this um, during the um, presentation of um, um, Sally and Tang Fei, I, I think, um, because in some way, um, you can see the EU as um, some way of regional cooperation, <laughs> because these are all individual countries, and there's always these difficulties, like, of, of, like, what are my country's interests, and what are the European interests, and just because of being the EU, this is not going away, and there are um, huge fights on each of our um pieces of legislation where you have different um, national circumstances and different interests for uh, in each country and um, um, different economy. And um, so we always have to bring these different backgrounds together in order to come to a, a common view and to adopt at the end um, common objectives and also common um, legislation um, and this so 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 often um, what we have at cops <laughs> this is all happening um, all the time in all these eu uh, processes and, and rounds um, where we meet and and discuss and at the end have to agree in our like the mechanisms we have um, been setting but it also shows the power um, that um, regional cooperation can achieve um, without losing your country <laughs> and still um, being an individual country with individual interests. But it's also clear that um, that there is somehow like a system of like competences, what is still remaining in each national competence and what are like the competences then of um, further um, international um, at the, at the at the higher EU level that is of course defined in our treaty but I think in a similar way we can look at the um, global perspective that we can um, see like what is the what are the areas that are clearly um, like an issue of um, in each country um, but still on those issues we can still learn a lot from each other for example um, in the EU, in, uh, we now have a new mission on carbon neutral cities. And of course, the European Commission has nothing to say at the level of um, city governance. Um, um, but um, bringing this huge program um, of like, uh, the aim is that we have at least 100 climate neutral cities by 2030 in the EU. But bringing these front runners um, from many different cities together in one program so that they can learn from each other how this is possible um, is, is a very um, good way of um, um, advancing um, these targets, even when in the individual countries, um, um, 
the situation looks very, very difficult, different, like in energy terms, in like economic terms. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Anchor. Uh, now I, I see the hands from Dr. Yang Li. Well, Dr. Yang Li is the executive director of the Institute for uh, China Europe Study, and he's the co host of this event. Dr. Yang? Okay, thank you, Dr. Hong. Yeah, and uh, I see there are uh, quite a lot of questions uh, from the audience, but maybe allow me to use the privileges to call Nizer to, <laughs> to ask a question first. Okay, my questions are uh, respectfully to Sally and Anka. And the first one to Sally. And uh, uh, Sally, you mentioned uh, the uh, United States uh, Inflation uh, Reduction Act. And this act uh, actually raised some concerns from uh, countries or organizations, including uh, the European Union and the Republic of Korea. So what's your view on that? Uh, do you think this uh, disputes will affect uh, the uh, multilateral climate negotiations or processes. So this is my question uh, for Sally. And my question to Anka is that uh, the five points for avoiding empty uh, promises you raised are very interesting. Uh, in your rich experience on climate negotiation, do you think what are the major obstacles, if there are any, to realizing these points in the upcoming COP27 and the subsequent negotiations. Thank you. Sally, do you want to take the floor from here? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm not 100% sure which concerns you're referring to with uh, uh, South Korea and, and uh, the EU, but I can say that um, uh, I do not believe that they'll be affecting any multilateral discussions and agreements and, and working relationship uh, with Japan, EU, uh, South Korea, they've recently signed a pact to move forward um, on cooperation. Um, um, but I, I have to say that the big part about the Inflation Reduction Act is really to focus uh, at home on our domestic uh, work, um, on improving our own grid, improving our own highway uh, for. Um, electrification of cars, um, um, and also our own resilience in our own coastal cities, but also internationally increasing um, our support uh, on climate adaptation and resilience uh, globally, both in Pacific islands, as well as um, uh, coastal communities in Africa and whatnot. So I don't know what the criticisms are that you're highlighting, but I can only say that um, that the multilateral F, F, uh, efforts that were announced recently uh, for Pacific Islands, and then uh, the work that we're really looking forward to domestically at home um, has only, can only uh, reach a high level of support. It is re reaching a high level of support because it's jobs, it's infrastructure improvement, um, and it's really getting us off the, um, our addiction to oil and gas which we, and coal, which we've had for many years, and moving us into the future um, uh, decades and centuries needed uh, for a modern um, uh, energy uh, um, infrastructure and work here at home and helping internationally. Well, thank you, Sally. Before I'm going to get back to Anka later with Yanli's second question, I want to pick a few questions for our uh, for audience. The first question go to uh, Dr. Chen Fei. Uh, does China currently have a research program for geoengineering? A lot, uh, forgive me if I did not pronounce those words very carefully. Um, it's called carbon dioxide removal, etc. And then I'll get back to you later. And a question for uh, Dr. Fukawa uh, is about will the developing and developed country gap and their divergence of interest become the major predicament for an integrated global efforts combating climate change? How, for example, in the Japan's case, and how, uh, how can Japan help or cope with this reality between the developing and developed gap? So I'm going to give it for to Dr. Chen Fei. You go first. Yeah, OK. Um, I think that. It uh, really depends on how we define the geoengineering. I think regarding to the uh, carbon removal that uh, um, China do have the action plan that will support uh, the carbon removal technology, especially the so-called CCUS, the carbon capture 
and utilization and storage that uh, uh, in early of this year, the Ministry of Science and Technology just issued an action plan to support carbon picking in China. And they specifically list the support to CCUS as one of the key actions in that documents. And regarding to the um, to the geoengineering and spandry to injection the uh, particular matters um, uh, um, uh, into the atmosphere, that uh, I think globally um, a few project has been funded that towards that idea, and about uh, uh, four or five years ago that. Uh, Ministry of uh, Science and Technology of China have funded a 2.2 million uh, dollar project for uh, experimental that idea. And that project is conducted by Beijing Normal University together with others. But that project is very much regarding to uh, explore the science and the mechanism of the uh, geoengineering together with the social science aspects and how that will impact different group of peoples uh, instead of to conducting some real experiment in the atmosphere. So that is generally my um, information regarding to this uh, geoengineering practice in China. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tenfei. And then uh, Dr. Fugra, um, we'd like to respond to the earlier question. And there is also an, a, a related question for Japan experience. The question to you particularly is, how does Japan raise domestic climate awareness before local government and then the NPOs mobilize citizens to engage in voluntary maritime uh, environment protection? So I'm going to give these two questions for you to respond together. OK, thank, thank you for having me a floor. To both of them is a very, very important thing. So the, I'd like to uh, answer the question in the first part. That is, uh, 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 we need a good uh, shared vision and uh, ambition to uh, cooperate with uh, and the feeling gap between the developed country and developing country. And uh, uh, I think that the uh, COP uh, is uh, making uh, such a kind of Good ambitions and the uh, uh, UNF Triple offering such a kind of uh, target and uh, uh, achievement uh, goals. But uh, as you know, the each region or each nation having the different situation, the different uh, perspectives. So we have to break down the uh, size of the uh, cooperation. Uh, so, for example, in Sea of East Asia, the PMC is trying to formulate the uh, sustainable development strategies. And uh, only limited countries within the uh, East Asian seas, but uh, uh, it is very, e it makes it uh, easier to uh, thinking about how we can uh, make a, a actual cooperation. And then we try to thinking about the scaling up to the global basis to filling the gap for the uh, said uh, gap between the developing countries and the developed countries. And the same same things can be said for the locals. I mean that the, uh, if the national government make a big ambitions for climate change action, but the Sometimes that is very difficult to understood by the local government people and uh, uh, some people who worked actually uh, worked in the field at, at the local area. So we have to divide uh, some issues and uh, try to uh, starting from the very, very small uh, action like a uh, uh, ill class plantation by the uh, local people and say this uh, iglas pl plantation is a kind of the uh, countermeasure for the climate change action and the people is starting realizing that we are connecting to the issue of the uh, national regional and global basis action in that sense su such a kind of uh, awareness rising is very important to uh, uh, bring the uh, local or uh, uh, regional uh, uh, government to be involved. 
and I, I'm thinking that the science is a, uh, a kind of the uh, universal uh, word for, for making this happen. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we're a little behind the schedule. Anger, do you want to take a very quick response to uh, Yang Li's earlier question before I give the floor back to Yang Li for his concluding remark? Yes, um, thank you. Um, um, so what are the major obstacles, obstacles for these initiatives? Um, um, I think I would like to come back to something Tang Fei said earlier. The COPs are now coming to an implementation phase. So there are not so many um, new rules and new agreements, but it's more like we have to implement what we have said. So the COPs will become more boring <laughs> in, their, in their results because we cannot repeat Paris every single year. Um, but our leaders, they want us to have some big results on each COP, and that leads to these type of initiatives, um, these short-term initiatives. Um, they want to have something for the press conferences, and so we get more and more of these initiatives, because from the COP, you cannot really get um, these um, very um, glorious um, results from the point of view where we are. And I think we have to be a bit more honest with like what the COPs do at the moment, and at which COPs we can really um, look at much um, at, at bigger results and bigger um, achievements. And I would like that we um, come to these initiatives in a more in an in an other um, approach, so that we have that we are building on existing cooperation activities that we already have, for example, Germany and China um, and other countries, um, and that we then see look at those what is really useful what can we expand from those cooperation activities and that we then pre prepare a more global um, um, cooperation um, in a more inclusive approach in a longer time fr time frame with all the other countries and looking at the different interests of all the other country uh, participants um, and that we in those approach also look at finance for developing countries that uh, that participate in these um, initiatives, because this is not only an issue at the COPs, but also for such type of regional um, cooperation activities, so that we build more from bottom um, down um, from what we have um, to um, higher levels and that we all that we look at a more um, longer time frame. Um, and um, also that at governance structures for this, at um, finance, at monitoring. And then I think this can be a much more um, successful than a lot of these short term initiatives that we um, are sometimes seeing at the COPs. Aslan, Aslan, thank you very much. Uh, we know that there's just many very good questions in the, in the Q&A box, so we are not able to cover all of them. Now I'm gonna give the floor to Yang Li to have your final remark before we uh, wrap up. I'm sorry, a little bit behind the schedule. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Hong. And uh, I'll be very brief because I think today's uh, event has already been very informative and enlightening. So uh, therefore, you know, my, actually I'm not very capable of uh, making concluding remarks, but just uh, share some, some of the things that I've learned from today's event. And also as the uh, co-organizer of this uh, webinar, I would join Dr. Hong Long for uh, congratulations on all the speakers, uh, Professor Wang Shen and also the other panelists for their excellent presentation. And uh, the, the, the discussion in Q&A session was also very interesting. And uh, I think uh, COP26, as some of the speakers pointed out, has made positive and remarkable progress and with unprecedented numbers of initiatives. So I think this has raised the expectations on COP27 for further substantial or tangible outcome. But on the other hand, COP27 is the first major global event or climate event after the uh, geopolitical shift mainly brought about by the war in Ukraine. And the rising uh, strategic rivalry among major powers, a worsening energy crisis, a looming economic recession, and a flare up of numerous regional tensions not only add pressure on the international cooperation on climate change, but also cause uncertainties for the entire international system and the global governance. So in this case, uh, what is less expected from COP27 might be that the conference would send a strong message that climate change is still a common concern to the international community and the momentum 
for international cooperation still persists and will continue. So it is not only helpful uh, for the climate in its natural sense, but also uh, the political climate around the globe, which in turn will contribute to the collective efforts on climate change. So I've learned a lot from uh, today's event, but for the sake of time, I can only share this tiny part of my takeaways from today's roundtable. Thank you. And I will return the floor to Dr. Hu. Well, thank you. And thank you, Dr. Yang Li. I, I certainly echo with you. I really learned a lot from all our panelists and who share their views from different perspectives on this uh, very important subject. With that, I would like to conclude today's webinar. I would like to thank all of you for spending your time with us and for this very, very impressive and, and very enlightening discussion on climate change issues. We look forward to hosting you in our future events. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you all.